Record. Let's see. Recording. Meeting on the tractor infrastructure micro tractor. I just want to go over the the OSC schedule just a little bit. So currently on the calendar, the first thing is still the the aquaponics greenhouse. End of June, if we can manage it. For that, the there's uh, actually a missing link. Uh, we're trying to get in touch with. Uh, Mark McMurdy, who's one of the seminal figures in the uh, world of aquaponics, pretty much like the father figure of that. We're trying to invite him to the workshop, uh, but I got to follow up on that. Um, we started an aquaponics working group at the Permaculture Voices Conference. We've done some good design. We've got a, some decent people on a team, a uh, good, strong core team on that. But we haven't moved forward on the actual, a lot of the design we're, we're um putting working on developing that team and, and developing the design still uh, we still hope that the workshop will happen it's not not sure I mean it's a lot it's pretty tight with about a month and a half left right now uh, that would have to come into place by um, like within the next week or two if we if we're gonna run it um, that's gonna be like only like 30 days till that announcement so uh, that's pushing it. Okay, but right now on the calendar, we've got the Power Cube workshop for July 10th th through the 12th. So we're looking at building four to six Power Cubes, depending on how many people sign up for that workshop. And that's pretty much the structural Power Cube that, that can be used as a structural part of a tractor, such that on July 13th through the 15th, we're building a micro tractor, which would be essentially the Power Cube with tracks and a loader for uh, an immediate application of the power cube that can be pretty potentially powerful. And right after that, July 16, 17, right now we're, we're talking to, to Dan Hartman from Dan's workshop. If you look, Google that online, let's see. Um, let me just Google that, dansworkshop.com. Um, put that in a calendar and uh, hang out there. If you look at that, scroll down a bit, and he's got in the third blog post, he's got the charcoal powered car. So, what we're going to do is the charcoal powered micro tractor. And currently, we're looking at a, a pancake design of, of the charcoal instead of having a big drum that's kind of unwieldy. Do a flat design of an eight inch thick by three foot by three foot kind of a pancake, which can strap right onto the back of a power cube and have about four gasoline gallon equivalent of charcoal storage in that so that would make it a you know from from a just an experimental design of a gasifier to something that could really be used in practice because that's that's going to give you about four hours of runtime for the micro track which is just perfect and the form factor of it is such that it will you can actually use it you know uh, it's not something dangling from the tip of your tractor or something like that it's it's compact and tightly fit Okay, so that's uh, we're aiming to put that workshop on within the next week. We're kind of going through the design, uh, basically scoping this whole design, how we want to do that. Um, after that, we've got <clears throat> so July. Let's see, we got the gasifier workshop. I just covered that. Uh, July 18th through the 22nd on the calendar, we've got. Uh, an open source GIS and slash design slash site design workshop. So we've got a person from OSGO. Uh, let me just put that up here. OSGO Live. If you haven't seen this, this is the link here. Basically, open source GIS, geographical information systems, applied to a thorough pr process of how you go from zero to a finished site plan, basically like a permaculture site design, with all the layers on a map that's cloud, cloud shareable, in, in professionally packaged GIS software, and the good part is it's open source. We're also considering one guy from the the open street map project where with aerial drones you can take pictures from two sides and get very accurate like two inch topography maps of a site so that's that's in the works right now we'll see if we get that guy but we definitely have the guy from us geo live um, available for this workshop and we're trying to put that on the calendar within the next um so everything absolutely everything is on a calendar by the first of june 
So moving forward, August 15th through the 24th, that's going to be our big summer of power, the big tractor build event where we build a tractor for Scott. Uh, that's going to be a workshop. We're looking at building both the backhoe and the bulldozer at that time. And the results will really de de depend on how many people show up. We, I would say that if more than 24 people show up, then if we can get more than 24 people, then we can definitely build those three things. Uh, our track record on the tractor right now is um, the last time we built it in five days. Uh, it was very inefficient at that time. It was pretty much like uh, it was a, wasn't an extreme production run. It was pretty much a, an experimental production run. We can definitely do that in a more streamlined way if we, if we get the design in place in advance, which we're working on right now. For the track, for the, the backhoe, we have a prototype that we've done before. There's some mistakes in it that we got to correct. We can do that. And then a bulldozer. So we're talking about a 30 to a 36 thousand pound machine with with six power cubes so we're talking about pretty much testing the limits of whether the gvcs as it is using the existing components can build the world's biggest machines so this is really pushing the uh, testing the modularity aspect and scalability aspects of the set to max it out and see if we can do that uh, upon if we're successful in that we're going to use both the bulldozer and the ripper on this bulldozer in the September 12th through the 19th workshop, which will be with Mark Shepard of Restoration Agriculture. And that, that's intended to be a site design workshop um, where we actually do some of the earthworks for erosion control and ponds and, and earthworks and uh, waterworks. So that's a hey, summary, Mark, summary uh, of the plan. Mind, let, let me interrupt for just one second. I, yeah. I, I'm curious about that, the Mark Shepard and, and the, you were saying the ripper. What, what exactly is a ripper? Keyline plow, that's the permaculture okay. word. Okay, because yeah. I, I have a uh, dual bottom plow that I use to rip some swales, and I noticed in that Mark Shepard video that I shared earlier, mm -hmm. he, he was using the uh, front blade of a bulldozer to rip a quarter mile long swale. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, they said that he initially started out with a Cat D4, uh-huh. Uh, I think, and they said that that was not sufficient, and they had to upgrade to like a Cat D7 or something like that. Right. A heavy, heavier duty, and then it was able to, to do the work that it needed. That's right. We're looking at a Cat. That, that's in that link that I shared a while Okay, can you share that link again, because my computer crashed. Oh, okay. Um, well, I'll share it on the, the side over there. Um, and this was Mark Shepard doing it. Yep. That's correct. Uh, you need a, the word on the street is you need a D6 or higher equivalent to do the proper work in one pass. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're aiming for. So six power cubes, 150 horsepower, plus a lot of dead weight in the form of concrete slabs. Just basically power cubes are pretty much filled with con concrete dead weight. Like basically cubic, you know, basically fill in the empty space with concrete, which is uh, cheaper than steel for if you want to get dead weight okay so that's cool on that okay so um with that said hey, scott um tell us a little bit more about um i don't know anything related to your needs on a tractor and just for for the record so you're looking at a tractor that you can use in, down in belize that will get you what kind of functions and specifically are you looking for down there? Yeah, Marjorie, I think first the truck will probably head out to Ron's ranch. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he just finished his five year master plan mm -hmm. uh, with a few of the permaculture. Um, might live out there for at, at least six months, be put to work out there. Okay. Um, it may even actually just bypass the leaves. We might ship it straight to Costa Rica. Do development on the on the 148 acre property, but um, that is pretty much virgin land. I mean, a lot of it's old growth that we won't be touching, but we we have about 40 acres opening for uh, permaculture design center space and wolf farm. And just uh, compared to what you guys are, are doing in Missouri. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Now you. Uh, so so if the date right now 
<clears throat> the proposed date is August 15th through the 24th. You can make that. You'd be able to make that, or? Yeah, I'm pretty sure I can, and I will try to get a hold of Ron tonight or tomorrow to confirm that that works for him. Okay. And then even if he's not available to come, if those are the dates that work best for you, then yeah. I can pretty much commit to those right now. Yeah, that's pretty much determined. Like, right after that, there's actually a... So we're going... Katarina and I are going to a... We have a Ted Fellows retreat on the 26th, which is in California, so we got to do that. And when we get back, we're going to do... I didn't mention in the schedule, but... Upon coming back early September, September 5th weekend is going to be the A Forest workshop. So let me put a link to that. A Forest. Um, Here's the link for Marshall, everybody's the, reference on the that. The tractor that we'll be building in August, will that have a Yomis plow or, or a key line? Um, I mean, this one, I mean, the tractor itself is just a tractor with a loader bucket, so so no. I think we should put a uh, pretty much like a PTO. So we're looking at um, learning from the tractors before where we had the, the power cubes dangling off the back. Right now, because they are structural, we're looking at putting on a three-point hitch on that upon which you can hang all your implements, whatever you got. We can talk about, I actually would like to build build the Keyline Plow. Um, when I was looking at the Global Village construction set, we have the... You guys there? Oops. Let's see if we can reconnect. Uh, are you guys there? I think he's back. He's probably going to have to restart his uh, recording. Okay. Uh, no, the recording recording's still going on. Um, okay. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, we lost you. You yeah. totally dropped out for a while. Okay. Uh, some bad connection here. So anyway, the how far did you hear the I uh, did you hear the the structural power cubes on the back are the new thing for th for the future iterations of all life tracks. Like the Life Track 4, we had the, the non-structural power cube in the back, which made it very hard for any implements to be put on the back because the power cubes are in the way. So with a structural power cube, we can hang whatever um, additions that are supposed to be behind a tractor with structural strength. So we can put a three-point hitch, whatever kind of an implement mount um, that will hang on to the structural power cube which where the power cube like in the heavier version like for the bulldozer it will be half inch steel for now like this the smaller tractors like up to 54 horsepower you probably want to just use quarter inch steel for the tubing for bigger than that like once we go to to the monster machines we want to use the half inch steel wall tubing still the same 4x4 profile except the wall thickness on the metal is half inch instead of a quarter inch so Scott, it would be great to get the Keyline Plow in that work weekend workshop. So that means um, the schedule on my side here is to to put up all the workshops by June first, and from June first, pretty much uh, focus on making sure all the designs in place. Tom's got the power cube pretty much under control. We're working on the uh, on the micro track for the for the scaling of up to any bigger machine up from the micro track that means you can pretty much put power cubes back to back uh, or with an articulated joint in between them but basically think of just bolting them together uh, if the structural strength is not sufficient we can put additional 4x4 tubing members to connect the power cubes but as is the idea was that you can connect at least two power cubes to one another to retain a structural unit that you can put everything else onto. But for the 
the big workshop in August, August 15, uh, the idea is to experiment a bit with with um, what are the limits to, to the stack, stackability of the, the power cubes. Um, the As far as the keyline plow, we should definitely put that into the August 15. Um, that's a, I mean, if you're, if you're into, I don't know how relevant that is for the site that you have, but I mean, if, uh, I know for us, it's quite relevant to get the fertility, to do key line plowing, to get the, the moisture penetration into the soil and to get all the microbes stirred up and going down into the key line furrows. The concept is basically you dig, dig with the key line so that the soil starts forming from where the key line plow went, like, because then you allow water, you microbes. You can perhaps like put biochar down there, just basically like uh, maybe key line plow through like biochar so that biochar falls down there. But basically you're starting to get the fertility happening, the biological life happening a few feet down under the earth. So the earth rebuilds itself. So that's critical for us, what we want to do here. Um, mm -hmm. It'll be good to... I, I know yeah. Costa Rica, we're going to be making a lot of biochar with, with the deadfall there on the, on the oven that one of the other partners is developing. Uh -huh. So... Um, I can, I, like I said, I'll try to talk to Ron in the next mm -hmm. 24, 48 hours uh, and send you a list of all the attachments that we would hope to be able to acquire or build. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, if it's, yeah, yeah. I mean, so if we if we got that 10, 10 day build, uh, there's only so much we can do, but hopefully things like, like right now, key line and backhoe and bucket. Yes, absolutely. Uh, the three point hitch on the back, that's got to, that has to be done because I mean, we can't put implements on the back otherwise. Uh, so yeah, um, then we can talk about what, what other things can be managed in that time. Um, yeah, so on the, tell me on the Costa Rica land, is it, so is it treed up right now? Is it like former ag fields or it's like just raw, raw land? I mean, just, just a forested land. Scott, did you get uh, in out there a little bit. Okay, sorry. So in the on the. Sorry, I was having a problem hearing you, but just of your question is what is what is the land? Yeah. Um, 148 acres. I would say maybe half of it is old growth forest. Is like I said, right outside of Corcovado National Park. Uh huh. Um, the gentleman that we acquired the land from, he and his wife lived on it for about 30 years. Kind of small scale farmers. Um. Someone's actually down there right now doing a bunch of soil sampling for us. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he's been on no crop in there, so we might have to, to let him rest and develop new ones. But I think some of that area, at least probably 20 acres, would be um, secondary growth forest that you, mm -hmm. to develop. Um, but it's it's not particularly rocky or hard soil. It's, mm -hmm. it's it's soft. I mean, it's the southern part of Costa Rica gets a, a fair amount of rain certainly during the rain season as well. But yeah, um, I can have the guy that's down there right now try to send me some more information on the soil to get to you. Yeah. Um, so so things like I mean, is the is that land like pretty? I mean, just like anywhere. I mean, is it eroded or or is it like so you would want to do the key line plowing for or fertility building and all of that or I mean I have no idea what it looks like down there yeah you, you, I mean the, you definitely want the key line plow to be one of the implements at that time hmm um, I keep cutting out here no I, I asked if, if the key line plow so you definitely want that to be one of the yeah. implements Yes, so key line plow would definitely be one one implement that you're interested in. Oh yeah. Sure. Yep. Yep. So for sure for us, because I mean I think for our work here, like the, the single most implement for um, like reworking the soil right now is the key line plow for us. I kind of thought it would be like a spader for preparing soil, but since we're gonna uh, focus a lot on the perennial polycultures, alley intercropping, then there's not a lot of case for tilling as much as there is for like rebuilding the earth through things like key line plowing so anyway that's that's the new learnings from this year
Okay. All right. Um, anyway, so that's good stuff. Um, let's see, Tom. Can you fill us in on the uh, the latest on the power cube? Like, what are what's the real challenge? And to summarize the basically the pump issue, which we have issues on on sourcing the pump. Yeah. Okay. The the uh, pump. Uh, we we've gone around and around about it, but I think yeah. you know. I, in my survey that I've done, I don't think we're going to be able to to hold on to that three quarter inch shaft because mm. uh, the only other pump that I've seen that has a three quarter inch eleven tooth spline shaft is Cessna, and it's a very low RPM. Um, yeah. So what's so, the deal? Um, how come? Um, so did you kind of like look at that exhaustively? Like just no one makes these kinds of pumps in three quarter inch blind? I, I think yeah. that, you know, this is just my presumption, but I think that the three quarter inch is large for that displacement of a pump. Mm -hmm. And uh, say so if, if you want to, you usually you have larger shafts, but they're, they're usually re related to higher displacement pumps. Mm -hmm. And so that's why most everybody goes to the five eighths, and and the five eighths is only one eighth inch less than the three quarters. Yeah. So I'm thinking that we we should really Just probably give it. that a go. Um, okay. And and you you had mentioned that some of the five eighths inch blind shafts had been destroyed. I mean, is that the actual shaft itself had been destroyed? No. No, I mean the idea was that all those pumps, I mean, they ended up. The, the persistent issue there was that we ended up like with pump leaks and and what's the reason i mean was it that the hydraulic fluid was dirty or whatever or shaft was misaligned i mean i don't know but we just know that it hasn't really worked well until we like we never had a failure of the three-quarter spline shaft yet the, the pump with that um well that that, that i'm thinking is something that we could um uh probably control and i think a lot, a lot of it probably had to do with the shaft misalignment yeah and, and uh, with the, the current setup the way we're doing it, it it's been really good and i think if we mm -hmm. uh, apply a little bit more tolerance checking to it to make sure we have uh, tighter tolerances on the like the parallel plates between the pump and the engine yeah that, that's real big. Uh, parallel plates and the the shaft coupling mm -hmm. if we mm -hmm that those are, are very very precisely done then I mm -hmm. think the rest of it will just fall in place okay yeah we got to try it um, <clears throat> yeah I mean that's pretty much our only option so use a splined 5 8 inch pump yeah but, but the, the cool thing is that when we do go to the 5 8 inch mm -hmm. we have a lot of options we have dynamic and, and mm -hmm. uh, currents and we have a lot of choices to choose from okay well, um, let's just so that really opens up a lot, and it gives us a lot of fallback. Whereas for the three-quarter inch, we don't. I mean, I can't even find a single source of it right now, mm -hmm. much less uh, three alternate sources. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. Um, okay. Now we'll have to have another jig. I have one jig for welding that uh, spline, uh, you know, the shaft coupling. Mm -hmm. But we'll have to uh, come up with another one. Uh, or, or maybe just take the one I have and tool it down a little bit to the, the uh, five eighths inch shaft instead. Okay. Okay, that sounds good. So, with respect to the latest CAD, is that up online? Are you are you done with it yet, or, or are you still working on things? Well, uh, funny you should mention that. I tell you what, let me let me give you a screen here, and I'll show you what I've been doing. Okay. I was working on yesterday and also uh, also today. Nice. Yeah. And are you seeing it? There we go. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, this is this is what I have now. You can see all kind of parts flying around to the sides because yeah. it's all the stuff I've been dealing with. You yeah. Know, trying one part and trying another. Uh huh. <clears throat> but this right here is what I have for the output, and you can see I have two uh, one-inch output hose barbs, so we can. Whoa. Do the that's the output of the. That's the return line. That's this is a suction, suction su Sorry, suction line. Okay, yeah. You see, we got the cool. two with the yellow handles. And yeah. These are coming out of the suction strainer, out of the uh, hydraulic reservoir. Yeah. And then this is, you can see the the one other line. It lines mm -hmm. directly up with the pump. So okay. That that will be our our input to the pump. Uh, how is that connected through a hose? That that'll be a rubber hose going between these two. It's a because I, okay. had to, I had to do that to stand it off a little bit so we yeah. can get some more distance. 
because yeah. those rubber hoses, they need a little bit of room in between one and the other to oh, wow. deflect and okay. to not have vibration. Yeah. No, this looks pretty exciting. I can see how, I mean, that is like way simpler. I think that's a major piece of progress there, right? I, I like it. Yeah, and then, I think that's uh, good. Also, on the other side yeah. over here, I, I reworked the, uh, the, 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 where the oil filter and all that goes. Mm -hmm. And right now, um, I, I moved it up over here. And so all we're going to have attached to the tank is going to be just the one little swivel. Now, also, I was looking at the hose, hoses that we were using, and it was those JIC-fitted 3,000 PSI hoses, which is way overkill for return line plumbing. Mm -hmm. So with that in mind, I said, all right, well, we need to go with these swivels, and we can go with a little bit less uh, rigid hoses. It's something that's a little bit more flexible. It'll give us uh, shorter bend radiuses and, and that kind of business. <clears throat> and then I, I looked at it, and I... And I decided, well, we can move this the filter away from the tank and just move it up like this. And so the way I've got it right now is, is so that it's um, on a little bracket over here with together with the, the ports for the, uh, oh, okay. Okay. the uh, pilot valve and, and case drain return will go right here, and this would be the return. Okay. And, then the, and these, again, are going to use the standard uh, NPT fittings rather than the JICs. Mm -hmm. And then... Um, anyway, I'm, I'm still working that out as far as the plumbing for that, but that's, this is, I'm, I'm liking the way this is coming together. Okay. And then the outlet of the pump, you just have the quick coupler right on a pump? No, this is it right or... here. Because, uh, the, the reason we can't have the quick coupler on the pump is because it has to connect up to the Bypass. Uh, pressure relief valve. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, this is what I'm showing right here. Okay. And, uh, so what we'll do is from the front side of the the power cube. Oh, I've got lots of junk flying around here. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> but so here's the output of the pump right there. Yeah. And then here is the input to the um, to the pressure relief valve right there. <clears throat> so we'll just have a little hose that goes straight okay. from here to there. Okay. And this will will need to be the JIC hose because those those other hoses, uh, return line hoses, they're not rated for that kind of pressure. They, okay. They stop at about 2,250 psi, and so we need this to be, um, you know, 3,000 psi compliant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so, at any rate, we'll just have a hose go directly up here to this one, and then this is going to have a um, return right over here. And it'll go back over to the uh, to the oil filter. It'll, it'll couple with the oil filter right there, and uh, and so that'll be for our our um, pressure relief overflow. You know, when we have over pressure, it'll just drain directly. And I put it in front of the oil filter because I, I want it to be filtered before it goes to tank. Because uh, just in the case this pressure relief valve decides to come apart, uh, I want the filter to catch the fragments. Because um, this one, these pressure relief valves, uh, essentially what what we're saying. Is it that this this valve, in the case of overpressure, it will uh, basically <clears throat> how do you say it? it? It'll dissipate all the power that this extra that would have been dis that, that would have been delivered at that that overpressure. Sure. And uh, and yeah. so what that means is this thing is going to get very hot very quickly. So these things have to be kind of expendable, and that's that's also why I wanted it bolted to the frame so that we can dissipate. Expendable. Heat. I mean, they're designed to to be many, you know, reusable. I mean, that's that should be living forever, right? That, I mean, a lifetime should be high for that. I mean, it's not designed uh, to fail when when it bypasses. I mean, it, in fact, the bypass condition can be frequent. It's right? not a one-time thing. I mean, this is a a high uh, re highly reliable pressure relief valve, and this is the more heavy duty of the valves that they have. Mm -hmm. But uh, it, they, I, I've heard that when people, they, they've used these in test setups and mm -hmm. in, in order to test other equipment. And when they do, like you, like we were talking about brake testing and all that, they say that these things totally fry. They, and they totally, they'll, they'll, they'll start rusting, they'll overheat. And mm -hmm. if there's any seals in there, then, then the seals will come all apart because it, 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 it gets very hot. Because even in this case, like, like we have here, it'll have to dissipate up to 28 horsepower in a single 
you know, a little metal block like that. And then that'll get it really hot very quickly. So we just have to be aware of that and, and uh, be ready to... I mean, I, in, in normal operation, you'll never fry one of these. It'll never happen. But but it's only in exceptional circumstances. Yeah. Um, when, when you're doing, if you have like a brake test set up or you you have some sort of a, say, say you, in your bulldozer, you, you're, you're, you have it to where it's going downhill and you have to do regenerative braking and all the power gets dissipated in that one uh, mm-hmm. unit right there. I mean, so, something really weird and, and unusual. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so anyway, I, I did that, yeah. and then also like last time, I was uh, beginning uh, to put like the control panels over here, and the, and the control panel for the power cube. I mean, all it is is a key switch and a throttle, so mm-hmm. that's pretty straightforward. But mm-hmm. uh, um, <clears throat> Jean had drawn up a control panel for the um, for the life track or the micro track. And it looked really good, so I figured it well. With this, maybe we can integrate it along with that. Maybe bolt it a little bit to the side, and you know. Uh, and this is flexible; we can move it around, and then uh, we can bolt the other controls in front of it. Yeah, it's looking good. So that's pretty pretty much where I am right now. Um, now, one thing I did want to catch up with you on is the plumbing. You see this one right here. And we do have this extension where it comes yep. out of the center of this tank and it goes directly up mm-hmm. and it has a valve on top. Is that right? You wanted a valve? Yeah. Um, the valve is not even um, necessary, is it? I mean, we don't really need the valve there. It's just a filler. Right. I wouldn't think so. I do, I do we need a valve there for anything? I have, I have one here right now. What's the the, what's the, what is its purpose? Well, the original purpose we put it on there for was to re- prevent uh, sloshing out from yeah, as it goes from side to side. But but since this is in the center of the tank, you don't have that sloshing. And so also, since we extended the height of it here, we should have less overflow coming out of this uh, port. Yeah, I, yeah, I so don't I, think we need the, the valve there. We do, we do need it? I don't think so. I think part of the reason for that was if we wanted to stack power cubes vertically, that didn't that have something to do with that? I think so. Yeah. Um, let's see. What's the logic there? Mm. Yeah, we can always put that valve back in, or are you going to use a longer pipe if you take out the valve? I would use a little bit longer pipe. I would raise it up so that the fill port is almost to the level of the, the top of the power cube, kind of like it is now. Mm-hmm. Just a little bit less, you know, make sure we don't bump into anything and break anything off. Yeah. Um, okay. How far is it offset from the bar, the, the tube, so you can get a filter in there? Like, not a filter, uh, a funnel? A filter? Uh, no, a funnel, uh, just a we, funnel. We have right now, if we go all the way up really to here, funnel. that's uh, one foot, one and three quarter inches. So it's just a little bit more than a foot. But off the off the tube on the top there, how far is it away? From the, the top? Oh, you mean from the side over there? Yeah, from the side. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Yeah. I, one, hmm. Almost two inches. Okay. Yeah. So let's see. Let's just think about the condition. Like if we're, so I I don't have clarity on this, but if we're stacking power cubes for bulldozers, I think the best configuration is if you go to the side and to the front and back, like not vertically, because for example, if you have a bulldozer, you want to put a cab on top of, like I was thinking the the cab would actually be on top of the power cubes that are on the bottom. So you're kind of like riding in a cab that's above these power cubes. Right. Um, in which case you're not stacking the power cubes vertically, just either front and back or to the side. So, but do we foresee any purposes where we want to stack them vertically? In which case we would want to close off that port there for leakage if you start, if you stack vertically. 
Um, right. I, I don't. I don't see that. I mean, the, the other way to do it would would be we could just take this port and just take the valve off and and uh, put the filler, you know, four or five inches down lower. And then if we do need to stack it vertically, vertically, then you can add a valve to it if you need it. Yeah, and that's a one inch tube. Um, or, it's either one inch or three quarters. Okay, so. you got to make that one inch definitely. So make that note because we three quarter is gets you trouble filling. So definitely okay. one inch. That means you probably have to reduce for the breather cap because those typically are three quarter. Hey, Martin, one, a... one thing I, I was wondering about that, and I've heard that there's uh, so much trouble about burping while filling and all that. Right. And, and it just uh, occurred to me that, gee, well, you know, um, it, it, has anybody tried to fill it and put a, like a little straw down all the way through the length of the, the tube while it's filling to let the air flow parallel to the uh, fluid? Uh, as long as that straw does not go reach down to the liquid level. Right. That's what I'm saying. Just just to, enough to reach the top of the tank and then have it reach to the air on the outside. And then you can fill it. And I'm, I mean, I, that's just a, a one idea. But I mean, I, I'm not sure even going to a one inch would really resolve the burping issue. Uh-huh. Oh, yeah. Uh... But I've, I've seen some of those funnels, you know, they have the, these filler funnels, and, and uh, they'll, they'll be very long funnels, but they will have a little straw that parallels the, oh, wow. the where the fluid would go, you know, and, and it's just for that purpose for breathing. Uh, can we just open up another hole elsewhere that we do put a little valve on for breathing while you're filling? Because that would address that, that issue, right? You mean drill another hole in the tank? Uh, yeah, we don't want to do that. Is there any other way? Is there any, any other place where we can put a, hole, a breather hole for filling? Uh, that's already available. Well, yeah, I, I, I would just say maybe one time, if we can find a little straw and try that one time and just see if that helps or not. I mean, that's a easy. Uh, right, test. right. Um, can we do? Um, that could even be like a little straw, like you get when you get your uh, go to the, the get a big gulp at the store, you know. It's the regular straw you just stick down, or how do you hang it? Um, just, just well, if I were to do it, I would take a funnel and, and I'd have the funnel put it on top of the tube, and then uh, just put the straw down in the middle of the tunnel and have it standing, sticking maybe four inches above the yeah, you, know, you know where the the, the funnel uh, ends, and then. And then uh, just start pouring fluid in, and it would flow around mm -hmm. the tube, mm -hmm. not through it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. I mean, worst case, worst come to worst, we could develop our own OSE funnel. You know, it'd be a long funnel that would have a little tube in parallel already. You know. How about a th yeah, three yeah, D printed a three D printed one? You could three D print a funnel that would hey, work for this. Sounds like a plan. Uh, yeah, okay. No, but I, I see the issue of... Uh... Just printed it out of some plastic that is uh, uh, oil resistant. Like ABS? Is ABS oil resistant? Oh, I just noticed my uh, fan is actually embedded inside the tube frame of the mm -hmm. power cube. It's no good. Yeah, let's see. So, as is right now, is the... How symmetric is this? This is not. We can't make the frame itself symmetric because the tanks wouldn't fit, right? Right. Now we could shorten the tanks. We could use uh, smaller uh, tanks, but that's the only way we could make it fit. I think. Mm-hmm. Um. Okay. Right. Okay, so let's see. Any other um, main questions on this? Uh, let's see. So I think I mean I think it's coming together. Um, I think that's largely well. it. I, uh, the next thing, once I get all these uh, um, uh, all these geometry.
circuitry and the plumbing figured out, then I can go ahead and generate the, um, the, the hoses and we can start getting hose lengths and I can start generating a BOM. Um, yeah. I was working on a battery mount for it and that's that basically it was going to look like this. It basically it would be like a little uh, two-sided mount and we can place the battery inside the um, inside the frame kind of like uh, let's see if I can do it right, right now. Move the battery over a little bit and then move it down like move it right over here somewhere. Mm -hmm. And then we can have this little two-sided frame that would uh, that would basically hold it in place. Uh, where is the frame attached to the outer tube member? I see. This thing would basically come with the battery. Oh, okay. Well, that'd be... I was thinking, thinking it could go like that, and then we can just lower the whole um, assembly, and then we can mm -hmm. drill a, a hole in, inside this, this um, so we could bolt it to the um, yeah. tube like that, and there you'd have a battery mount. Okay. And you wanted to move it down just a little bit to get out of the way a little more? Yeah, we can we can put it as long as... Uh, I was thinking this would be like a 2 by 2 angle iron. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we could... As long as it can reach those 1 inch holes there. Mm -hmm. Sounds <clears> good to me. Can you just show the the little bit of the issues on the non-symmetry and let's see whether we want to kill that or how much just talk about a little bit how much that matters or not because um, um okay here here's the issue with the non-symmetry if you look at the power cube from the side you see nine holes on this side and it's eight holes high yeah. on the structure steel um, and so the non-symmetry part of it is, you see how this, this tube right here is on the in, inside of the cube. Right. But the corresponding tube over here is on the outside. Right. Same thing for the bottom. Now, as far as structural strength, I don't, I don't think it'll, it would affect the, the strength of the cube. Um, the, the bolts holding it in there on three different axes for each corner, that, that's where you get your strength from, and that, that is not changing. Um, so also you can see from this side the you can count nine holes here. So horizontally, either direction, uh, it's it's nine holes, and then the vertical we have eight holes high. Um, so we had tried to build uh, a power cube, and I think we did did build one, and we have a kit for another one that's an eight by eight by eight cube with vertical tanks, but that that was having some fuel delivery problems. Um, so this is the, the design we've, we've pretty much settled on right now, um, going forward. Wait, hold on uh, a second. What, why, if you, if you symmetrize it, in other words, put the ones on the right-hand side to the outside, the verticals to the outside, why wouldn't that work? Oh, because the uh, engine is there? You're right. Oh, yeah, the, the engine, back of the engine. See, there. You see the yellow part right there is the engine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, I think that's yeah, it just doesn't fit unless we shrink up the fuel tank. Um, is it possible to put the? Hold on a second. Is it possible to put the fuel tank in more so it's so it's actually the distance between the two fuel tanks is smaller? Would that allow the everything else to fit, or it doesn't doesn't allow that anymore? If you put the fuel tanks in more so that they don't go into the way of the wait, does that solve the issue? Yeah, the fuel or no? tank would bring it over kind of like this. Yeah. 
So they would be inside the four inch tube? Yeah. Yeah, they don't fit, do they? It's really, really close. And then, then, then this right here is, uh, I don't know, it might fit. We'd have to figure out, we'd have to move the fuel cap a little bit, but that's, that can be done. Um, Wait, does that address the symmetry issue? Or that doesn't change anything? Basically, I tell you what, if we have this much room to play around with, I mean, this is already a six inch thick fuel tank. Mm -hmm. And if we have that much room to play with, I, I would, well, I would I tell you, I would opt to go with a, a commercial off the shelf fuel tank if we can. Um, right, but then how do we mount the engine? So we have to redo the engine mounting? Yeah, we could figure something out for the engine. I mean, right now we have the fuel tanks hanging from these uh, two-inch straps right here, so you know, yeah. we could figure something out for the engine as well. Right. Um, well, that part would be something that will drastically simplify the production of the, of the power cube. Um, right. The tanks are the most complex yeah. thing to build. And, and they're also very heavy, um, yeah. and they're they're problematic building it just because they do welding those things, the plates on the end of. Right. No, that's. At any rate, that that's hmm. another one of those things that, that we might think about for the future. But I think for the July run, we're gonna have to stick with this design right now. Just do that for now. And the tanks right now are how big? They're 24 inches. Um, Long. it's I think it's 22 inches on the side. Tape measure, we'll measure. Where's Jonathan today? I'm online. I'm oh, just, uh, I'm listening. I'm on the field working. So uh, yesterday I worked 21, 22 hours straight, and then I got called back in this morning. So it's been a long weekend. You slacker. <laughs> I had a lot of extra few hours there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's been a long, one. long week. Well. This one's right at 22 inches or 21 and a half, something like that. Mm -hmm. And they, they hold about seven gallons per tank, and that's both for hydraulic and for uh, gasoline. Mm -hmm. This one mm -hmm. also, you can see, I, I took the, uh, the sight gauge and I moved it up a little bit, went with a half, just a six inch long sight gauge mm -hmm. uh, instead of the 12 inch one, because mm -hmm. really, I mean, this will tell you everything you need to know. Right. If the, if the hydraulic fluid is more than this, then you're good. If it's less than this, boy, you better add some quick. <laughs> mm hmm Yeah. 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 Uh, just to wrap up the fabrication question, if we're going to be building four or six of these in a, in a workshop, how do we get the, the tanks made? If there's... I mean, that's not... That's not, um, unless we have welders, skilled welders, that's going to be pretty hard. So what's the assumption there? Maybe maybe um, we have like a couple of people dedicated to welding the tanks and everyone else does prep? I think so. In yeah. fact, some of you better people. Yeah. And also, the one thing I, I'm, I'm going to be uh, uh, testing soon enough is I want to test the fabrication techniques of and instead of using the standard bevel and standard welding techniques we had been using, I want to use that, that something similar to uh, to what we saw in Austin when we went over there. Uh -huh. And and that guy, what was his name? I forget. Um, Adam or, or anyway, the, the guy had some real good tips on doing that. Yep. Welding those tanks, and I think I think we can. Uh, apply those other techniques to it and, and weld consistent tanks with less leaks. Yeah, the techniques can be applied. The question is getting a really nice straight cut on the ends of the tanks. Because if those cuts are not straight, his techniques can't really apply them because the spacing will be different. Yeah. Oh, anyway. Uh, technique. I, I mean, I mean, we can do it. We can absolutely do it. The qu but probably just for for reference, and during the workshop, there's gonna have to be two people uh, that have to do the tanks that we know that are skilled. And it may have to be, if nobody else has the proper skill, then it might have to be me and you. So, at the worst case, we can we have to be ready for that. 
or at least make it that we're not needed in other places for the tank welding. Hey, I'll tell you what, uh, Jonathan was up here working with me on one of the, some of the tanks a while back, and, mm -hmm. and he, he had a pretty good hand on doing that. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, hopefully there's going to be people that we feel comfortable with, and that, that could be a good point. Like, that could be a nice, like, in the education part of the workshop that we can basically get people experience on that, and we can see who actually can do it reliably yeah yep okay well that sounds good sounds good to me so i yeah that's i mean that's the biggest risk for the workshop itself for the power cube getting finished that's the biggest issue there yeah as far as the cnc torch tables so the guys from caruza there uh it looks like they will be testing theirs like within a couple of weeks so we can copy their design uh, in which case I would build that here, like in June, to have that available for the workshop. So that would be good. That would be really good. Right. Yep. Um, yeah, which would remain, that, that would just leave the, the tank welding as the toughest part of the workshop. But I think we, we'll, we'll handle that. I think that'll be, that'll be fine. Do you remember what the size, the max size of the uh, uh, seal that that thing could take? Their design. Um, max size of steel. It depends on the plasma cutter. The standard is piercing through half inch. Is oh, I mean the uh, length of it. Yeah. Uh, it's yeah. scalable. It's absolutely scalable. They're doing it so you can put the structure as long or short as you like. So. Yeah. Yeah, like five by ten for us, five feet by ten feet for us. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. All right. Well, um, I don't know. I think that kind of wraps up. I think we're in pre pretty good shape on the power cube. Uh, that's pretty good. Um, Microtrack, I think, is moving forward. The, we're definitely moving forward on the um, gasifier. That's good. That should be really good. Um, Let's see what else. Yeah, so anything else? Is that all we got to cover for now? Or? Tom, you got muted. Here we are, yeah. Um, you know, the only one of the, what is it, are we done with the power cube? We're done with everything or what? Yeah, I mean, as far as for this meeting, are we okay to proceed then? So we'll go on the on the smaller shaft pumps. That was the biggest question. We can do that and make them work. Yeah. Yeah, get a little bit more precision in the uh, shaft alignment, and I think that'll that'll probably solve that. It, um, the only one thing, uh, Scott, are you still there? Yeah, I'm here, Tom. Yeah, the, the one, the only one other thing I, I uh, would like to share with you is, is uh, that there's uh, uh, this one YouTube video uh, I ran across and it's by these people called um, Eco Oasis and uh, video and they were there doing permaculture things in your neck of the woods down there in, in the uh, um, in the, in the Costa Rica or somewhere down there. I think they were in Puerto Rico, but basically in a tropical climate. And they had some really good tips that were just for that. So maybe, uh, maybe that. Is that the, the YouTube link you just sent? Yeah. Post. Cool. Well, I will certainly check that out. Thank you. Mm -hmm. But other than that, that's, that's all I had. Okay. Um. Jean, anything from you? Any any other comments or? Yeah. Yeah, I uh, think. Tutorial for tutorial. All recordings that I did while I was working on the micro track infographic. And I and I'll post the link to. Well, I'll post the video to YouTube, and then I'll send you the link to that. It's, yeah. Uh, right, it looks like it's six hours of video that needs to be edited. Holy cow. Uh, are you trying to put six hours up, or? 
Can you? Yeah, I think it'll it, it'll just make it. It's Twelve hours on YouTube. Okay. Six hours, but the file size is like pretty manageable. Something that's manageable for somebody to download. So, something that's no more than a gig. Right. I'll try and see out. See if well, we yeah, can like get. I said, I'll see what comes out. And see if. Reduce to if it's necessary. Yeah, but YouTube will let you put up something that long. Right. I've seen um, videos that are. Like, uh, yeah, I, I think they're actually 12 hour long videos. I think that's the longest you can post. Okay. That sounds good. <laughs> Crazy. Wow. Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That sounds good to me. Yeah, so we're, so you're talking about the instructional of how to actually make an infographic like that, that we can edit and actually... Um... Right. It, it pretty much goes into step by step. Wow. You know, how I uh, created that infographic. Excellent. Excellent. Um, right. Okay. Okay. Well, that's that would be something good that we can, if we could teach people. But the missing link for anybody, though, is uh, they have to have some some art skills, though. I mean, without that, you can't really do it. <laughs> right. I mean, you need some... Uh, well, I mean, really, it's, it's a matter of practice. You don't need that much skill, but... Uh... I mean, once you start drawing, uh -huh. whatever it is that you're working on, you can refine the drawing every every time you, you you basically use each previous drawing as the underlay for the next drawing, and you clean it up as you go. Oh, wow. That'll be interesting. Right, right. That's, hmm. That would be the easiest way to go about it, I think. Yeah. Okay, well, maybe one day we can, we, we'll be teaching our people how to do that. Yeah, that'll right. be good. That'll be good. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, and another thing. So, no, I mean that's that's about it. Um, that sounds good. Hey, Scott, anything else? Any other comments? Uh, or? No. I, again, thank you for including me on this call. It's nice to talk to you guys. Um, I'll try to get with Ron as soon as I can and um, confirm that he can make it. I can certainly make it in August. And um, yeah, if I have any more questions, I'll email you. Definitely. Okay, guys. Well, I think that wraps it up for today. Um, thanks. Thanks a lot. We'll be in touch. So next time, so we'll we'll continue the Friday 5 p.m. The sorry, the Sunday 5 p.m. Um, just to keep checking in on the the micro track and power cube and gasifier. Yep. So so till then for this team meeting. Okay. Thanks a lot, guys. All right. Have a good Sunday. You too. Bye bye. Hey Scott, you still there? Yeah, I am, Tom. <laughs>